Washington news agents. Do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is only on the ticket because she is a black woman? Well, I can say, no, I think it's maybe a little bit different. So uh, I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much. And she was always of Indian heritage and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I she respect went to a historically either black one. college. I respect either one. It is extraordinary. There's no matter how many times you listen to it, it still sounds utterly bizarre. Because Kamala Harris has been absolutely proud, up front of the fact that she had a Jamaican father and an Indian mother, so she has South Asian heritage, and she has Caribbean heritage. This was a convention, a conference, that Trump chose to attend. It was the Association of Black Journalists. And you can hear what's happened in the room. They are just laughing at him. It is the most powerful sound in the Democrats' arsenal. Laughter. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. <laughs> and we're still kind of reeling from the clip. But it's not as if we haven't heard Donald Trump do that before, because this is the sort of thing that Donald Trump does with people of colour. With Barack Obama, it was the whole conspiracy theory that he hadn't been born in the United States and therefore was ineligible to stand to be the president. The and whole with Nikki Bertha. Haley. I and mean, with he Nikki did Haley. all this like, oh, where's she from? Couldn't even get her name right. You know, tried to call her Nimraza, sort of, you know, full name. I mean, he does it with his own side as well. Yeah, exactly. And it's just a problem that Donald Trump has with race. I wonder whether there is a more deliberate strategy here and not just throwing red meat to his base. That is undoubtedly part of it. But I think it is part of a thing that they're trying to do, cack handedly, I might add, to try to paint Kamala Harris as some kind of chameleon who changes her voice, who changes who she is, wherever she happens to be. If she's in Georgia, she adopts a faint southern accent. If she's somewhere else, she'll advance a different policy. And that there is something they want to stick in voters' minds that you can't trust who she is. Unfortunately, that was just absurd, what he did last night. Look, I think the interesting thing is this whole question that Democrats are now wrestling with, which has been going on for about eight years, which is whether to call Trump racist. And I think in the early days, they started calling him racist and then thought, oh, no, we're scaring people off. We don't want to make it look like we're calling his supporters racist. So they adopted it and said, oh, well, we just have to say he uses racist language. You know, it's not about the voters. It's about him. And I think now they've come to a point where they're just kind of saying he's comparing himself to... Abraham Lincoln as being the president that brought the most to the black economy, to black workers, to black entrepreneurs. And actually, he's just a racist trying to kid himself that he's not. And I think one of the things that is coming out of this convention, this kind of meeting, is the new response, the new strength, vigour, in what Democrats are prepared to say now. Because when they hear a room full of people laughing at him, and when Kamala Harris takes to the stage, as she did later that night, to talk to a crowd in Houston in Texas, this is the kind of moment that she manages to create out of, again, laughing at his rhetoric. This afternoon, Donald Trump spoke at the annual meeting of the National Association of Black Journalists. And it was the same old show. The divisiveness and the disrespect. And let me just say, the American people deserve better. The American people deserve better. The American people deserve a leader who tells the truth, a leader who does not respond with hostility and anger when confronted with the facts. We deserve a leader who understands that our differences 
you hear the crowd, that recognition, the penny drop, when they realise that she is going to find a way to talk about what Donald Trump has just said about her. And there is this ripple of laughter. And I think it goes back to a little bit what we were talking about on the US episode yesterday, which is they found a way of emasculating Donald Trump. They call him weird or they just laugh in his face. Nobody's taking him that seriously anymore. They're not even calling him a white supremacist. They're just laughing at him. But on Capitol Hill, Republicans are tearing their hair out. Yeah. They thought that Donald Trump had alighted on a good strategy of how to attack Kamala Harris, which is on policy, which is to say you've absolutely messed up the border. You've absolutely screwed up on kind of the cost of living under Joe Biden's administration. You are an arch and arch liberal and you are going to sell our country out. Those were the areas which the Republican Party had alighted on as to be the sensible policy from where to attack Kamala Harris. Except Donald Trump then goes on and says, well, she's decided she's black. I mean, what a ridiculous thing to say. Now, Larry Hogan, who is the governor of Maryland and is now standing for the Senate, has said those comments are reprehensible. What Donald Trump has said, a Republican who is running to stand in the Senate, says they're absolutely deplorable, the comments. Other people yes, of a more kind of, you know, liberal Republican view are also saying something similar. But all of this is playing into something else that is happening at the moment and that the polls are tightening. Now, I've just seen an NOP poll for the uh, swing states and it's showing that Kamala Harris is doing well. Ahead in Pennsylvania, ahead in Wisconsin, tied in Michigan. So suddenly, now, you know, these are one set of polls and things might change and you know, it's one set of polls does not make a summer, but it looks like there is movement and it's in her direction. And Trump is going to hate that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's worth considering whether there is strategy to what Trump's doing. Does he go towards the National Association of Black Journalists because he thinks he can win over more black voters by doing it? Or is he going there to remind his base that he'll, you know, take them on, he'll show the liberals, he'll show the Antifa, you know, whatever his line is, it's actually not talking to the people in the room. It's talking to the people back home who he thinks will be on side with these comments about Kamala Harris. Either way, it doesn't sound electorally that sophisticated because he's already got those he's people. He's got the base. He's got the racists. He's got the base. You know, he's got whoever loves hearing him say that. So why isn't he actually working harder as I think he was a few months ago? You know, I'm not pretending they're not deeply stereotypical, but he actually did go after the black vote in a much more, I think, proactive way by saying this isn't about identity. It isn't about race. It's about me giving you, you know, better jobs. It's me getting the economy going. It's what everyone cares about, you know, whatever race you are. And I think that was a strategy that his advisors had put in place. We, we heard it from Steve Bannon, which is like, yeah, there is a vote to go for. You know, a lot of black voters feel slightly left behind by Biden, you know, feel slightly ignored by the Biden administration. All that has changed under Kamala Harris. They are invigorated. They're excited. And he's gone doolally. So instead of actually sort of talking to black voters in a grown up serious way, he's now just insulting people. Well, look, after he made those remarks and they lit up social media, Donald Trump did what Donald Trump does, which is to double down and treble down and repeat it again and again. I wonder in the cold light of day whether that will persist or whether he will see that there is more danger. The other thing that he did when he was there, and again, I think the strategy is to appeal to more black people, but he spoke about illegal immigration, sure, fine. But he then spoke about illegal immigration being a threat to black jobs. What is a black job? If you just think about it for a minute, what he's really saying is, you know, if you're flipping lower burgers, paid, lower, lower paid. paid, if you're flipping burgers, if you're unskilled, uneducated, then illegal immigrants are coming after your black jobs. Yeah, yeah. It is such an extraordinary yeah. racial stereotype of what people are in a room full of highly qualified professional black journalists. Mm. And you think the dissonance that he creates with remarks like that. And you think, yeah, the base might go, well done, Donald, go for it, Donald, say the unsayable. 
But if he needs to reach out to people to broaden the support base, I just do not see how these sort of comments do it. Yeah. And on the other side, today is the day when we are expecting Kamala Harris to be certified, you know, whatever the... Certified? Well, what do what I, as a <laughs> lunatic? <laughs> no, what do I mean? Not become the actual nominee, yeah, nominee for yeah. the... Official. Yeah, the official. Um, the official... The men in white coats come to take her away. <laughs> this is how it all goes wrong, isn't it? Does. It does. <laughs> we do so well on this podcast and then we suddenly lose it. <laughs> I'm going on holiday tomorrow and yeah. I think you can probably hear it. Not certified... Uh, in a sort of mental way, but certified in a as the official, official candidate, candidate of the Democratic, of the Democratic Party. Party. But before we leave this completely, I do want to talk about tone because we've noticed something in the change of tone. We called it a sort of a vibe campaign since Kamala Harris has come into the race. Everything feels shaken up. Everything feels a little bit more exciting, joyous. You know, there is movement for the Democratic strategists that thought there was none just a month ago. And it's really interesting comparing that to the kind of tone that Trump falls back on when he's feeling cornered. And he gets this really sharp nose question from an ABC journalist who basically sets out um, the pattern of Trump and race that we have known and seen for the last eight years. Listen to it and his response. A lot of people did not think it was appropriate for you to be here today. You have pushed false claims about some of your rivals, from Nikki Haley to former President Barack Obama, saying that they were not born in the United States, which is not true. You have told four congresswomen women of color who were American citizens to go back to where they came from. You have used words like animal and rabbit to describe black district attorneys. You've attacked black journalists, calling them a loser, saying the questions that they ask are, quote, stupid and racist. You've had dinner with a white supremacist at your Mar-a-Lago resort. So my question, sir, now that you are asking black supporters to vote for you, why should black voters trust you after you have used language like that? Well, first of all, I don't think I've ever been asked a question so in, in such a horrible manner, a first question. <laughs> You don't even say, hello, how are you? Are you with ABC? Because I think they're a fake news network, a terrible network. And I think it's disgraceful that I came here in good spirit. Uh... It's the laughter. Again, I'm just listening to the laughter. They are not taking him seriously because we've all heard him attack journalists. We've all heard him call the press the enemies of the people. And now he's actually walked into a room full of black journalists who are asking proper questions. Look, the ABC correspondent went through a list of things that Donald Trump has said. Yeah. There's no argument about it. She wasn't making anything up. She wasn't being adjectival and saying it was disgraceful what you've said. It was appalling. She just read out what he had said, the way he has reacted, the spurious claims that he has made. And yet Donald Trump is very good at dishing it out. Not so good at taking it. Do you know what and I suddenly, say? Yeah. It's suddenly you're the meanest, nastiest person I've ever met because yeah. you dared to say that to me. But also, there was something of the Carrie Lake in that response, which is deflect. He didn't answer any of her question, right? Every journalist in that room will have heard him not answer the question. Insult the journalist, don't answer the question. So actually, if you walk away going, oh, did he... Did he refute any of that? Did he explain any of that? Did he apologise for any of that? Did, did he deny any of that? He didn't. He just he just criticised the woman asking the question. At least he didn't say to her, you need to get your head examined. Talking of <laughs> getting one's head examined, there was a question that came a little bit later from the panel of journalists on the stage about Donald Trump's vice presidential pick. And there is a gentle rumour mill sort of starting to ratchet up, suggesting that he is actually quite unhappy with the man he landed on, J.D. Vance, possibly the choice of his son's rather than his own choice. And he was asked directly whether his VP pick, J.D. Vance, would be ready on day one. Just listen to this really odd response. I've always had great respect for him and for the other candidates too. But I will say this, and I think this is well documented, 
Historically, the vice president, in terms of the election, does not have any impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, virtually no impact. It's not the full-throated endorsement you'd want, really, is it? If you've had a rocky couple of weeks where your childless Catwoman uh, comments have uh, caused a bit of a stir, you might want from your president a bit more vocal support than you got there. Rather than a mention of all the other candidates. A mention of all the other candidates and the vice president doesn't count for anything anyway, so get lost. Interesting to see what happens there. We will be keeping an eye on it. Just so you know, the the rumour mill and the person who's been fingered for pushing pushing out all the rumours that Trump is unhappy about J.D. Vance is Kellyanne Conway, still an advisor to Donald Trump. She who coined that memorable phrase after Donald Trump, alternative alternative facts. facts. And so she is being fingered as the person who has pushed out the narrative that Trump is unhappy with J.D. Vance. And of course, Kellyanne Conway has denied it. With the idea that he would change. Who knows? Who knows? Keep the options open. We'll be back after the break. There was quite a lot of fingering. Mercifully, two of the people who were stabbed in the Southport attack have been uh, released from hospital. Meanwhile, charges have been laid against the 17-year-old accused of murdering uh, three people. And he has now been named, even though um, he is not yet 18 years old, although he is next week. And so the judge in the case has decided that the name can be released to the press. And he is Axel Mugwana Radukabana. And uh, he is nearly 18 years old. And there is a court sketch of him that has been released when he appeared in court in Liverpool this morning. And after that horrendous, heinous attack on little girls in a dance class, a mob descended on Southport after the parents and friends and community had formed a vigil um, on Tuesday night. And the mob that was called upon in Southport had gathered as a result of disinformation that had been spread shared online about both the attack and about the suspect. And after a riot in Southport that left nearly 40 police officers injured or hospitalised, the riot then seemed to spread. I mean, it did spread. It spread to the northeast, to Hartlepool, and it spread to our doorstep here in London, to Westminster, where hundreds of rioters started flooding the streets. Dozens clashed with police. They were throwing cans, beer, glass bottles and other demonstrators were targeting and maybe you will believe this, maybe you won't, the the statue of Winston Churchill in Parliament Square. There are, I think, 100 people arrested in London during that violence. And this was all to do with reports, false reports, that the suspect in the stabby attack was a migrant. He wasn't. He was born in Cardiff. He lived his life in Lancashire. But you will hear from this clip that we filmed uh, just outside the kind of chants that were going on. And if you drill down, you'll hear people saying Nigel Farage for Prime Minister, Tommy Robinson for Home Secretary. They are eliding those two political entities as one group or one mob. And I guess there are questions now, questions as to whether we have learnt about the suspect's name because of this pressure from the mobs or whether it was because the young man is turning 18 next week anyway, so it would all come out then. And I guess there are questions as to how you view the protesters themselves. Are they one organised group? Are they, as the Prime Minister said, a mob? you know, that should be dealt with by the full force of the law. Is there something unifying and ideological about this, which is making the Deputy Prime Minister, for example, talk about, you know, conversations about whether to ban them, to prescribe them? Well, Keir Starmer has been speaking this afternoon, and this was just a taste of his thinking. Let me now turn to the actions of a tiny, mindless minority in our society. Because in the aftermath of this attack... The community of Southport had to suffer twice. A gang of thugs got on trains and buses, went to a community that is not their own, a community grieving the most horrific tragedy, and then proceeded to throw bricks at police officers, police officers who just 24 hours earlier 
had been having to deal with an attack on children in their community. Their community. And make no mistake, whether it's in Southport, London or Hartlepool, these people are showing our country exactly who they are. Mosques targeted because they're mosques. Flares thrown at the statue of Winston Churchill. A Nazi salute at the Cenotaph. And so I've just held a meeting with senior police and law enforcement leaders where we've resolved to show who we are. A country that will not allow understandable fear to curdle into division and hate in our communities. And that will not permit, under any circumstances, a breakdown in law and order on our streets. Well, coming up next, Neil Basu, former Assistant Commissioner at the Metropolitan Police and National Police Chiefs Council lead uh, for counter-terrorism policing. So the judge has now named the suspect and I guess it'd be interesting to hear from you, Neil. I mean, they, they've made clear that this is because he would turn 18 in a matter of days anyway. But do you think that the judicial system has been pushed into this prematurely because of what we've seen of the riots in Southport and, and more widely across the country? Yes, I do. I, and I think that's a very accurate summary of what's happened. But uh, it's clearly necessary. We are an exceptional circumstances and an, an exceptional time and the violence we've seen over the last couple of days has absolutely supported the judge's decision I think. Um, it's a very difficult point for police officers to do that while they are trying to conduct uh, the most serious of investigations but if, if it will calm tension and it will take some of the heat out uh, and clear up some of the misinformation then that is a very important thing to do. One of the things that we have heard over the past couple of days is Nigel Farage saying, are the police withholding information from us? Are we being kept in the dark by the police? Now, I suppose in a sense, the answer is of course we are because police do investigations. But when it is phrased like that, what do you make of it? Well, I think it's an incredibly unfortunate thing for a responsible politician to say. Uh, and it wasn't done in the House. It wasn't done as a a matter of concern as an elected politician. It was done over the media. And it clearly sends a very clear message that somehow um, there is a conspiracy that people are not being told the truth. Now, that has an effect. I mean, there was already uh, misinformation, lies, uh, various viral communications going out there, which was already inflaming the situation. And Mr Farage is way too good a communicator not to understand that, that his comments would have added to that. And that, I'm afraid, is a mistake. And responsible politicians shouldn't make mistakes like that. Do you think he is a responsible politician? Well, he wasn't in the last 24 hours or so. Um, I'm not the only person to say that. I mean, pretty much he united every other political party, I think. But as a former head of counterterrorism, I would not want people speculating. I have a great deal of experience in this area. It was my decision at one point to declare whether or not there was anything in terms of terrorism. Counterterrorism policing doesn't make that decision lightly um, because of everything that flows from that decision. And quite often it's not apparent at all whether or not there is any such suggestion until the investigation has taken place. It would be premature and very irresponsible to come straight out and say something. And I've had plenty of conversations with everyone from Prime Ministers down on that subject. What we've seen in the last 48 hours, I guess, is something that starts in these dark rabbit holes of the internet and social media and all the rest of it and becomes very real and very visceral and very violent and ends up with, you know, many police officers injured. And I guess the question is, what do you do with that conspiracy theory language? How do you fight it? Do you fight it by leaning into it, as it seems maybe the judge has done a little bit, by releasing a name, giving a bit of information? Or do you fight it by doing what Keir Starmer is doing and saying, you're a mob, you know, this is a riot, full force of the law. We're not even going to pretend that we owe you an explanation for things that we don't. Emily, I think you have to do both. So the first thing I'd say is, you know, common decency says there are 13 families who have been torn apart, three of which are grieving loved ones and an entire community that is completely distraught. Mm. This, this has been a total deflection. And if you're a decent person, 
you would not want the families to suffer twice. You would not want them diverted from their grieving or from their sorrow or from their bedside vigils by having to see and discuss this kind of horror. You know, and watching one of the families come out and say, not in our name, please don't do this. That is, that is not the position they should have been put in. So there is something about appealing to the most responsible people in the country to, to be very clear about what is acceptable and what is not. Now we live and we have lived for a decade in a very different era of news. Um, I don't think we can get away with the, um, we're not prepared to make any kind of comment on this at all. And we need to be incredibly clear about who we are addressing. So my view is Mr. Farage is an elected politician. He's an MP. His party got 4 million votes. Uh, he speaks for a, a political party that has been legitimately elected and he should be able to have his say. I would just appeal to him to go on facts and be very careful about the kind of people he might be uh, attracting both to his party uh, who are a completely different, a completely different matter. Uh, and that's where Keir Starmer has called the EDL a mob. And they are. Yeah, Neil, you know, I, I was listening to uh, Farage last night not in Parliament, but on his TV show, because he has twin platforms, doesn't he? He has the green benches of the House of Commons and he has his berth on GB News. And what he was saying is that the reason that you've had the riots in Southport was because the police weren't candid enough and they were telling the broadcasters to play it down what had happened there and what had happened with the stabbing of that lieutenant colonel in Kent. And therefore it was sort of the police's fault and it was sort of our fault in what he would call the mainstream media for not telling people enough. Well, for a, for a politician who claims that he's concerned about law and order in the country, I think undermining policing who are dealing with two of the most difficult issues in uh, this year in that manner is irresponsible. I mean, the police are not trying to play anything down. They're trying to investigate murders and attempted murders. I mean, this is... Uh, this is hard enough to do that job at the best of times, but whilst you're doing it with a microphone, a camera in your face, and people using multiple platforms, particularly social media, and we know where that's going to go, and I think the last research I saw saw something like 27 million hits within hours of the original story breaking. There's no doubt whatsoever policing has to be better at that. You know, We have got to be able to get out with a positive narrative quickly and promise to keep people updated. And, you know, it's something I had to do many times in counter-terrorism, and that is true. I'm not sure that's what happened here. I thought Merseyside, Lancashire and Kent Police all did an incredible job trying to bring some calm and authority to a situation uh, and help communities that were distraught and grieving victims. I'm afraid Mr Farage comes third to that. You've also got extreme political groupings that want to sow discontent that want to kind of undermine almost some of our liberal democratic values of an open society and the rest of it. How do you tackle that in our media age? We're getting into the, the crux of the matter, really, which is the argument over freedom of speech uh, in a liberal democracy. And, you know, which I have always said, and I've said this publicly, is not the freedom to do harm. So where freedom of speech becomes hateful extremism, which can ferment violence, anger, destruction of property and violence towards individuals. Clearly, that has got to be dealt with by the full force of the law. If you have a particular group that is beginning to see itself uh, as an agent for violence, then that group needs to be looked at very carefully. And I think if Southport was the work of the EDL as an organised group, then I would say my successors, the security service, probably the DPP ought to be huddled in a room discussing where the intelligence takes them and whether or not they have finally crossed a line what? from a protest group into a potentially extremist, even terrorist group. So ban them? Well, there's, I was incredibly proud of the fact that when Amber Rudd banned National Action in 2016, which was an extremist right-wing group, so they had crossed the Rubicon. They were discussing murder and conspiracy uh, to commit very serious acts of terrorism and violence and therefore had to be banned. And banning them gave us the power to break that group. And I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, my organisation did that uh, over a sustained period of time. So it gives you the opportunity to do that. But you can only do that when they cross that threshold, when they cross that Rubicon. Only a Home Secretary can make that decision and only based on the intelligence that is provided by the security service and policing. 
I would now be saying after it was such an extraordinary thing to wake up and see, you know, 50 officers injured, 29 of them hospitalized. I mean, I wasn't used to seeing that, that level of injury in the Met with its yeah. major protests. A line has been crossed. Serious violence has been committed. Now, they can be prosecuted under riot. They can be prosecuted under grievous bodily harm, and I hope they are. Um, but now we have to make a determination without turning them into some kind of glorified group as to whether or not they have become a terrorist organisation or not. If that is the discussion that has to happen, uh, but that has to happen between those agencies. If you were still leading um, counter-terrorism policing and the Deputy Prime Minister or the Home Secretary came to you and said, do you think this group should be prescribed, what would your answer be? I think from what I saw in Southport, and again, if that was the work of the EDL as an organised group, um, I would have I would have been asking for a review of the intelligence and I would want a conversation with the Home Secretary about that possibility. I mean, isn't uh, setting a mob on a mosque an incitement to violence? What, what, what further proof do you need? Whether or not they are an organised group or whether it was individuals, uh, whether it was mob violence, there's, there's a very, very high bar to reach mm -hmm. between violent protest and acts of terrorism. Section 1 of the Terrorist Act 2000 makes it very clear um, were, were there serious acts of violence towards property or people? And was it for a politically motivated uh, or race, racial or religious cause or an ideology? All of those steps have to be proven before you can call a group a terrorist group. And we have to be really careful when we prescribe groups. Um, my experience of terrorists is I'm afraid they love it. So if these people want to set themselves up as a terrorist group, you are giving them the glorification of the name and the purpose. And I don't want to incite any more people to do that. My great hope is that the extreme right wing in this country, which I spent a very long time trying to convince politicians and the security service to lean into that very rapidly growing problem, which, by the way, we've seen across the world. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to live in the United Kingdom because we are the people who push back against it. We have a genuinely tolerant nature. Uh, and when you look at the numbers involved in this, they're small. They were very small in national action. They're small, they're chaotic, they're disorganised. And largely, I agree with the Prime Minister, they are thugs. They're mostly alcohol fueled hooligans who like a fight. I do not want to give them any extra um, kudos for want of a better expression. Neil Bess, it's really good to hear from you. It's fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me. We're going to leave you with some what looks like to be exceptionally good breaking news. And this is about the Wall Street journalist reporter Evan Gershkovitz, who, if you followed his story, you will know was sentenced just last month to 16 years in a Russian prison. He's already served, I think, a year behind bars. And Bloomberg Politics is now reporting that Russia has released him as part of a multi-country prisoner swap. In other words, they gave him the 16-year term in order to then start doing deals between Russia and presumably the US. And presumably a very complex deal indeed, because uh, Gershkovitz seemed to have been guilty of committing a terrible act of uh, being journalism, a journalism. Yeah. being a journalist in Russia, where kind of press freedoms have gone. And he was an accredited Wall Street Journal correspondent. And his arrest, imprisonment really did send a shiver down the spines of those people who are left in Moscow reporting on the situation there. So uh, fabulous news. If we, we should say true, that, that he's on his way home. That alongside him is the former US Marine Paul Whelan. Um, so he's also been held in Russia. And we understand it's both of them that have now been released. As I say, we are just reading this as it's coming through. You might have more details by yeah, the time. Yeah, and there may listen. be more coming out because there was a, there's a German national who was being held in Belarus, who it looked like also might be part of some uh, prisoner swap. As President Lukashenko uh, suddenly announced that he was revoking the death sentence on him and it was going to be life imprisonment. So you wonder if this is a multi-nation kind of deal that has been sort of stitched up uh, over weeks I would imagine of negotiation of who gets what because there are some very high value Russians who the Americans held that the Russians wanted we'll want back. back. We will see you tomorrow. 
Yeah, we're going to see tomorrow. We're going to have a special Q&A edition. <laughs> How long can we carry on calling them special for? Uh, Every Friday is special in its own way. We are going way. to have an absolutely bog-standard <laughs> Q&A session tomorrow. If you've really got nothing else to do, I suppose you might as well join us for that. Bye-bye. They're always special because no, they're bog always standard. your questions. Bog or bog-standard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 